Welcome to everybody who may be joining us at the moment. This is the lightning lunch session on history of art today. My name's Emma Roberts and I'm course leader, program leader of BA and Foundation History of Art and Museum Studies at Liverpool John Moores University. And as you can see from the slide now, the topic of my talk today is the history of paint, how artists have used paint over the centuries. And we have our host with us today, Catherine Chilito from Student Recruitment and Admissions, who could also in the future answer questions about how to apply to Liverpool John Moores University. And I also have a slide in my own PowerPoint, which contains my contact details for later, in case you want to contact me directly with any queries. Sometimes you go away from a talk and think, oh, I wish I'd asked that. And so hopefully you'll have a chance to drop down my email address and then you'll be able to do that in the future. And then I think we can move on to the next slide now. So before I hand over to Emma, thank you, Emma, for that very warm introduction. Um, like Emma said, my name is Catherine and I will just be going through a few pointers with you today on how this session will work. Um, so first of all, I'm sure you're very now aware that there is um, no video or sound um, your side, so um, you can only see us and hear us. So basically you can sit back and enjoy this lightning lunch lecture that you're going to receive today. Towards the end of the session, after Emma has spoken, you will have the option to ask any questions. Um, so please do use that Q&A field which will be located at the bottom or the top of your screen. I will also at the end cover how you can reach out to us. Obviously, Emma mentioned that she will um, distribute her contact details, but also um, other ways in which you can get in touch with the outreach team or find out further course information as well. So I would like to now hand over to Emma um, and Emma will start today's session with you. Oh, thank you very much. So what I'll do to get this started is share the screen for my own PowerPoint. Yes, hopefully you're all seeing the front slide of my PowerPoint now. So as I say, I'm from BA and Foundation Year, History of Art and Museum Studies. This is a course that allows people to have many transferable skills. Most people do want to work in museums and galleries if they take my course, sometimes auctioneering or art therapy. But actually, even if you wanted to go off and work in tax or insurance or accounting or anything, it would still give you lots of great skills to be able to do that. And as I mentioned here, the topic of my talk today, the history of paint, how artists have used paint over the centuries, is actually taught on one of our modules in the first semester of the course. And that module is called Artists and Practices. So you're seeing today images and content that I would give to new first year students. So I'll get going. So people often use paint. I mean, for example, here, I have a box of paint and some little tubes of oil paint. And so we think, oh, well, that's paint. It's been around for centuries. It's always been there. That's what we do with it. But actually, when you think about it, paint is a relatively new thing in that sort of format. And we rarely give consideration to how it was used before you could just go to a shop and buy it in a block or a palette or a tube. So what really is paint? How did artists make paintings and all other artworks before they could go to a shop and buy it like we can today. So that's the sort of thing we'll look at today. And we also need to consider whenever we're thinking about paint, what's the backdrop that the artist is painting on too, because that really affects the type of paint they can use. So if they're painting on paper, they need a very different type of paint to if they're painting on the wall on some plaster or if they're painting on board. So really, even though we're thinking about paint today, we also have to think about the backdrop. For example, here we can see that these pre, um, Neolithic artists from the ancient times of human civilization are painting on the wall of their caves where they lived. 
So this is from 14,000 BC in Spain. So you see the artists have developed a paint and a technique of working with the paint that suited their backdrop of the rough stone walls in the caves in Spain. And this image is also interesting because it tells us that for centuries, I mean, as I say, this is 14,000 years BC, so 16,000 years ago, humans have obviously felt that it's a natural urge to make paintings for some reason. It's instinctive and within us. And that's never gone away in all those 16,000 years. So what the artists did here, they tried to make their mark, literally. You can see they put their hand on the wall and then they've probably filled their mouth with their paint and spat or sprayed the paint over their hand so that it then leaves the shadow of their own hand on the wall. And how amazing that is for us when we visit such a tourist site because we can feel connected then with a person who lived 16,000 years ago. And they've also, of course, drawn pictures of the animals they wanted to hunt, so deer and other things like that in the countryside. So how did they acquire paint to make this? Well, from very basic materials, they would go out into the forests, take some wood, burn the wood, and the black charred charcoal would then be used to make the black colour here. And the brown colour might be the earth itself, the ochre in the ground. So they would dig up some earth, mix it with water, and then blow that or daub it on with their fingers. Yellow would be similar, a different sort of ochre from a different part of the nearby region. They also ground up berries or insect shells, tree bark, and anything that would give them colour, really. So that's the most ancient sort of paint. But then if we move on quite a few thousand years to the beginning of the Italian Renaissance, that time when you think art history really began to get exciting, in Europe at least. So this is a painting by Giotto, one of the first people in the Italian Renaissance to really start making beautiful 3D artworks that had perspective. This was the new invention really of the Renaissance. Now he's painting on using tempera on the wall, in this case, inside um, a, a built stone chapel. So what's tempera painting if you can't go to a shop and buy the material? Well, actually, it's quite staggering to realise that tempera is made with eggs. So the artist would have, again, made all the paint himself and his assistants helping him. He would have made his palette himself, his brushes, everything made from scratch. But the paint was made by acquiring dry pigment. And that's the same as in Stone Age times. So again, they might have gone and got insect shells. Some insects are quite red in colour, so they would have piled them up dried, ground them up into a powder, and that would be the pigment. Then the pigment is added to liquid egg. You just crack an egg and pour that into the dried pigment maybe add a bit of water to. And the resulting effect is that when the egg dries in the air, when the paint is applied to the plaster in this case, it creates this luminous, iridescent sort of effect, a bit like a stained glass window here. The only downside with egg is it's not like modern oil paint that you can paint on top in layers and mix it all up. So they had to do all the reds in one part all the blues in one part, all the whites in one part, a bit like painting by numbers. And if you look at the figure on the right, the man with the vase or the glass, you can see the artist's brushstrokes. They had to be in straight lines next to one another. And then maybe sometimes he would cross hatch to create a bit of volume for the rounded stomach. But he couldn't mix a different colour paint for the top half of the man's chest where it's more white, he would have to paint that separately and then paint the darker brown beneath separately. So that's one problem with egg tempera. Following on from the Italians really experimenting with egg tempera, people in a different part of Europe in the region we now call the Netherlands, but in those days they used to call it the Flemish area of Europe, 
they sort of worked with a new type of tempera. And that was rather than using egg, they used nut oil as a binder for the dried pigments. So again, the pigments would still be the same, dried up stones, earth, insect shells, things like that. Then they would use nut oil to make it more gloopy and add that to often wooden boards on this occasion with the Flemish artists from the Netherlands around Holland and Belgium. But you can see the advantage of using nut oil is that the colours are even more luminous and brighter, even more like a stained glass window than they were in the Italian Renaissance using the egg tempera. So the lady's dress on the left hand side is such a vivid green, it stands out. And when you think that was made in 1434, still very bright and beautiful today. If you ever go to the National Gallery in London, you can go and see this. It's one of their most popular works. But the nut oil meant that unlike with the egg tempera, they didn't have to do the paint by numbers technique either. They could mix paints on a palette first and add those. So it was a lot more flexible and freeing to paint this way using the nut oil. And that's why they were able to achieve greater realism so you can see from the detail on the right where the mirror is situated, how much depth and perspective and realism there is in that mirror. It's a concave mirror, actually, not a flat mirror like we would have today. But still, you can see the realism and the detail because they can blend the paints because nut oil is naturally so flexible. But then if I move back to Italy, and here we have the Sistine Chapel, so famous in Rome, painted by Michelangelo primarily, although other artists were also involved in that. Now he used another type of paint altogether that was different from what we saw in the Netherlands with the Flemish nut oil tempera. Here he's painting with fresco. Fresco painting isn't used for small artworks, such as a wooden board, maybe a foot high, Fresco painting is used for large murals, very suitable then for painting the inside of a huge chapel like this. So the artist would make um, an outline on the walls in charcoal to let him realize where everything would be painted. Then he would paint wet plaster all over the walls. And there's a lot of natural lime in the wet plaster. Then he would make Dry pigment, the exact same pigments used since Stone Age times, this time though with no egg or no nut oil, just water. So he'd mix his dried powder with the water and then a brush, and then he'd daub it onto only the wet part of the plaster. And this is where you'd think we were chemistry students actually, because a chemical reaction happens with the lime in the plaster. It fizzes and bubbles together with the paint and the paint is actually drawn into the wet plaster and becomes the wall, becomes the plaster itself. And then it dries and there isn't paint on the wall. Instead, the paint is in the wall as part of the plaster. So that's why it lasts hundreds of years since the 1500s when this was painted. So as I say, it's suitable for quite large spaces so the detail isn't very tiny compared or rather in contrast to the Flemish artists. If you were to look at this close as you can see in the detail actually it's all quite daubed on the white blotches on the lady's hip on the bottom right of the detail are just swathes of paint swiftly painted on because he's got such a huge last a large area to cover. And then I'll move on through time and across Europe to look at some other types of paint too. This is gouache painted in England around 1600. And in fact, the box I showed you earlier was gouache too, but very different now, of course. This was used to paint a little miniature, no bigger than that of Queen Elizabeth I. So what's gouache? Once more, it's the same old dried pigment, but this time they mixed it with gum and that enabled it to be made into like a little block, which
which they could sometimes loosen with a wet brush and then dab that paint in a very detailed way onto this case enamel or sometimes it could be onto board or paper too. Very controllable because the gouache also sometimes had chalk mixed in with the dried pigment so that it would become a bit stiffer and a bit chalky. As you can see here, Queen Elizabeth I's face is quite white and chalky because of the chalk added to the pigment. But then I'll move on to the most famous type of paint of all that we're all very used to hearing about, oil paint. This is a bit similar to Flemish uh, tempera painting because it's the pigment made with oil again, but often painted on board or more usually canvas as oil painting progressed in skill. So here we can see the effects and benefits of using the flexible oil again. This painting by Vermeer has almost hyper-realistic detail when you see the rug that's, paint, that's thrown over the table there. Really able to get tiny little effects and lots of three-dimensionality with oil paint. But in fact, oil paint began most successfully to be really developed in Venice and not in the Flemish, Flemish region. And that was in the time of the High Renaissance with artists such as we can see here, Giorgione. Once more, look at the benefit of the oil paint with the way the fabric is folded in the bottom left-hand corner of the lady's gown. It can show off all the effects of light. It's lustrous and the smooth colors can blend one into another because oil is so naturally liquid and flexible. And here you can see Titian, another Venetian high Renaissance artist who excelled in using oil paint. I particularly love looking at this man's garment, his gown on the right hand side, which is meant to evoke brocade material that they would make in Venice at the time. If you happen ever to stand in front of the real painting, you can see that the man must have had the gown folded in his drawer and then put it on for this special occasion to meet the Virgin Mary because all the folds in the gown are visible, which he was able to do through using oil paint. So it was the Venetians who were the best ever at using oil paint. But it didn't stop with the Venetians. Right up into the 19th century, we get the French Impressionist artists like Monet, Manet, um, uh, Pizarro and so on, using oil paint, but with new material. They developed the Venetians expertise in working with canvas. The Venetians were the first ones to ever use canvas for paintings. And that continued with the French Impressionist artists as Monet. But what Monet did differently was work often with a palette knife. So he would then slash and swathe the paint in dabs and daubs onto the canvas. So you can see that on the right hand side, that big long white strip at the bottom was where he had a palette knife and he just struck it across the canvas. So you can see the speed at which he moved. In fact, he's almost not gone right down to the surface of the canvas, but flicked on top of the canvas, warp and weft. And that's why there's little black bits showing there. But it creates this wonderful appearance, which replicates how the eye really sees, apparently, in this impressionistic manner. We don't see everything like a photograph, I'm told. In fact, our brain and our retina in the eye work together to piece everything together for us so that our brain thinks we see like a photo, but actually our brain really sees like the image on the right hand side, which was what Monet understood. So we see the continuity of the use of oil paint there. And then that didn't stop in the 19th century. Right up into the 20th century, we had expressionistic and modern artists using oils, again with a palette knife, or with fingers sometimes to be very expressionistic. So this is an example of expressionism, where the artist was quite depressed at losing his partner. So he wanted to get his anger out, and that's why it looks so 
striking and um, stiff and staccato, really. He just struck and daubed the canvas to get his anger out. But then what is watercolour? That's a totally different medium. You might be used to working with watercolour in your school or college. Watercolour was an invention of the 18th century in England. And it was, again, that typical dried pigment from the ground or from insect shells, which was bound just with a very, very light glue and made into a block. And that could be easily loosened with water. So that's what artists did specifically to enjoy creating ethereal atmospheric effects of light and shade and things like the smoke of the fire burning here. And watercolour works really well with paper, so they could even wet the paper and then add the wet paint onto the wet paper to see how the two would bloom and create even more atmospheric effects. So we've been able to use watercolour ever since that time in the 18th century too. And you might be thinking that pastel is certainly not a paint. You probably do use pastel in your art classes. But actually, technically, pastel is paint. It's just paint pigment that's bound incredibly use, um, loosely in a stick form again, so that the artist can just move it onto some paper or canvas and all the little bits of pigment fall off and embed themselves into the paint or the canvas. So Degas, one of the French post-impressionists, managed to use pastel extremely effectively, as you can see by the wonderful scratchy use of the vibrant peacock blue on the right-hand side up on the top there. That enabled him to show the tulle, too, of the ballerina dancer's skirts. And then nearly at the end, but I wanted to come on to a contemporary type of paint which didn't exist before the 1960s, and that's acrylic. Once more, you might be quite used to using this, but it's relatively recent in the history of paint. So what is acrylic? This is plastic, which is bound with dried pigment. So not nut oil, not egg, not water, but plastic. And that's why it didn't exist till the 1960s when they were inventing plastic. But it's useful for creating lots of areas of smooth, flat colour. And things can be added to it, like water or oil, to make it replicate the effect of oil, paint or watercolour. David Hockney was a good first user of acrylic. I wanted to show you this one because you might have heard this is the world's most expensive painting. It was sold a few years back at auction in America for 90 million American dollars. The only problem with acrylic, because it's so recent in the history of paint, conservationists don't know how well it will last in maybe a thousand years. They know egg tempera has lasted for a thousand years, but will the plastics in acrylic last for a thousand years? We'll have to wait and see. And just to finish off, I wanted to show you that paint seems infinitely flexible. You can add things to it, you can do new things to it. Here is Jackson Pollock, the American abstract expressionist artist who added buttons, his cigarettes, nails, all sorts of bits whilst he had his canvas on the floor and chucked pots of paint onto the floor. So that's a new way of using paint in the 1940s and 50s. But then in the end of the uh, 20th century and into the 21st century, you get contemporary artists using a new medium for paint, the airbrush, which they would blow through their mouth. So they would insert regular paint, usually acrylic, but just very, very watery, into the container of the airbrush and spray it onto canvas. So that enables him to create hyper-realistic effects, like with this window in New York or with the car bonnet almost looks like a photograph was taken. My final image is just to show you you can even paint everything, even the human body. This artist, Eve Klein in the 1960s, used to cover his models in blue paint and drag them across the canvas on the floor, and that would be the remaining artwork. 
So the artwork is classed as both the final piece of paper from the floor, but also the experience of watching the performance if you're in the audience. So there seems to be no boundaries for paint, and we all wonder what will happen in the future with paint. And so that was a really brief whiz through, definitely a lightning talk. I could expand a lot on every one of those slides, but today is not the day to do that. Hopefully we may be able to do that when you come and see me in the future if you would like to do so. So there's my contact details there, my email address and my name. And you can also Google for our History of Art Facebook page, our Instagram account. We have a Tumblr blog and Twitter. And finally, I wanted, like Catherine will do too, to thank you for joining us today. And there's a link there if you want to find out more about other Lightning Lunch sessions. And we have a new web page you can click on to. And you can also email Catherine and her colleagues at outreach at ljmu.ac.uk.